title of this talk is Introduction to Modeling Tsunamis with GeoClaw, but it's kind of a potpourri of different, different things to get started, I guess. Um, so I'm David George. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, okay, so just an overview. Uh, I'll start out with the, just sort of a gallery of simulations that, that's a preview of GeoClaw, and that's mostly meant just, just so that you can sort of get the flavor of the type of numerical methods and the type of problems that we're working on. Um, and then since GeoClaw is, uh, uh, since GeoClaw is developed and uh, focused towards shallow free surface flows and depth average models, um, I want to give an overview of what uh, we mean by depth average models and how many different problems those can apply to. And then, and then we'll talk about tsunamis and the shallow water equations and then bore you a little bit with uh, description of hyperbolic systems and the finite volume methods and adaptive mesh refinement that we use to, to solve hyperbolic systems. Okay, so um, there's a class of related shallow free surface flows um, that are characterized by a fluid or variable granular fluid mixture flowing over variable topography. And I think of tsunamis as belonging to this broader class of problems. Uh, so for instance, it includes tsunami propagation, and inundation, storm surges, uh, regular uh, overland flooding, dam and levee breaches, for instance, but also sediment erosion and deposition and transport, and also a range of problems that could be uh, <coughs> called landslides or debris flows, but they include a, a whole range of variable mixtures of fluid and uh, uh, solid grains. And also dry uh, snow avalanches could, be, could fit in this class of problems. Um, but other than just being hazardous, shallow, free surface flows, they also have a lot of common mathematical features and computational challenges. So, for instance, for all these flows, the, the, the actual depth of the flow is shallow relative to the length scales of the problem. Um, so, because of that, they're often modeled with depth average models. So, so th these are, those are PDEs in 2D always. Um, for all these problems, the flow moves over co complex topography or bathymetry, which has to be treated carefully and accurately. Uh, the domain is of varying bounded extent, so there's some inundating shoreline, and that causes the problem of the moving wet dry front, which I'll talk about later this week, um, but it presents numerical challenges. Um, I don't know how much I'll say about this this week, but for all these problems, that, or for most of them, most of the time, it turns out that the dynamics are often a small perturbation to a prevalent steady state. And it turns out that that's difficult to capture numerically. Uh, so specialized methods have been developed for problems like that. And these shallow flow, shallow flow free surface flows are just one of those types of problems where, where specialized methods have been developed for this, this situation. Uh, also, these all feature evolving multiple spatial scales. So, for instance, tsunami being sort of the obvious example where you're modeling a tsunami on an entire uh, global scale domain, but to model inundation in some harbor, you need really meter scale resolution grids. So, so it's a uh, diverse set of spatial scales. Uh, let's see. Okay, so just briefly, and I'll probably say a lot more about GeoClaw as the week goes on, um, as far as the details of the program, but just... Just as a brief intro, it's an open source finite volume software package. Uh, it's a subset of a larger package called Claw Pack, which is for more general hyperbolic problems. Uh, but GeoClaw, the idea in developing it was that we wanted to develop a framework to accommodate commonalities of all these inundating free surface flows uh, because they present similar mathematical and numerical challenges. Uh, and it, uh, we use adaptive mesh refinement, um, algorith algorithms to capture that moving inundation or wet dry front over topography, and also uh, dynamic processing and tools for, for reading in topography data sets. Uh, and this uh, also, with AMR, facilitates use of, of very high-resolution DEMs. Okay, so sort of a uh, preview of GeoClaw. I'll just show some of these different depth average uh, uh, problems that we develop these models and software for. So the obvious one is tsunami modeling. This is the 2011, uh, the Hoko tsunami. Uh, 
So for this particular problem, we were looking at inundation in Hilo, Hawaii. So we had to use extremely high resolution grids for that harbor um, and use AMR to zoom in on it. Um, one of the, well, you'll, you probably already know this or you'll hear more about it this week. One of the difficulties in doing inundation modeling with tsunami modeling is uh, getting high enough resolution bathymetry at, at various locations. So that's actually why we were looking at Hilo, Hawaii here, because that's one place where we can get high resolution bathymetry. But um, we were trying to do inundation modeling around Fukushima, and it's very hard to get high enough resolution bathymetry that you can do accurate modeling there. Um, so we can also model uh, overland flooding through topography, and, and uh, this is related to tsunami modeling because it's this depth average mo you know depth ab average models. But I also want to show this because this th these simulations show more what it looks like when you're modeling inundation over rugged topography. So if you're familiar with this, this was the uh, Mount Passe Dam in southern France, which uh, failed explosively instantaneously essentially in, in 1959 when the reservoir reached the top. It's uh, 60 meters high, so it's in a rushing flood into the ravine below and eventually flooded out the uh, town of Fréjoux, uh, um on the Mediterranean. But this is a, a common, um, it's a popular benchmark problem for using shallow water equations for flood modeling because they surveyed the area well, well afterwards and they marked high, moder high water marks and, and uh, uh, there's extensive data and it's actually somewhat surprising how, how well all the shallow water models seem to do for this problem because, well, we'll get into the equations later, but there's nothing hydrostatic or um, when you watch these floods that there's lots of vertical acceleration going on. So it's somewhat surprising how well shallow water works. Uh, so this is a Google Earth. This is where the dam sat. The reservoir was back here. And you can sort of see this. There's a, a bend in this ravine below. So we do sort of the obvious thing, start with a fairly coarse grid and then follow the, the flood with higher resolution grids. Yeah? Yeah. Pretty main question, but at the, main, the, at the beginning, the flow is pretty three-dimensional and probably you have dispersion effects initially. Yeah, that's that's what I was saying. I mean, the, this this solution is just with the shallow water equations, but, but yeah, I, I mean, shallow water equations are obviously a fairly pretty crude model for something like this, but they, they do tend to work surprisingly well when compared to um, the field data. And have you tried with landslide tsunamis also? Uh, no, but I'll show some landslides here in a minute. Um, I'll talk maybe with people later this week if they're interested, but one of the research directions I've been going in is, is coupling our landslide model with tsunami models. But, uh, um, so what I just showed a that last simulation was zoomed in on the, the dam area here. But we can simulate over fairly large domains with the help of, of AMR. If one were to fit to use a topography fit mesh for this uh, region, um, it'd be fairly expensive to compute on, and it'd be fairly difficult to, to get an accurate mesh, given that the, the region's so rugged. Um, so with AMR, we can create fairly fine grids on the fly as the <coughs> computation's going. Okay, so last of the sort of um, preview examples of GeoCloud. This, this is... Uh, <laughs> sorry? Oh, how, how long are these? No, uh, if you change the mesh in increased time or why it makes some Oh, um, well, I'll probably talk about, about that a lot more in my next lecture, but uh, uh, here the, the grids are simply just following where the, the water is, and then they become uh, finer resolution if the, if the water is a significant amount of velocity. Um, but there's different ways of flagging how you want to refine particular features in the solution. Uh, so this next example, this was a, a debris flow uh, that occurred in Mount Meager, which is in uh, British Columbia in the Cascades. Uh, this was a, uh, I think, 100 million cubic meter debris flow, but it was in a, if this happened in, say, in the United States in the Northwest in a fairly uh, populated area, this would have been big news, but since it was in a fairly remote area in Canada, no one 
no one heard too much about it. But uh, the debris flow started somewhat um, seemingly spontaneously, uh, probably due to increasing saturation levels in the, in the soil, and then flowed down this fairly steep creek, slammed into this, this canyon here and actually bifurcated, so it went upstream here. So I'll show another. Uh, so this is, this is the source region. Um, it comes down Capricorn Creek here, which is fairly steep, and then hits this wall here, and the debris flow splits, and this is going up upstream, actually, and then flows out here. Uh, so I'm showing, showing debris flows just for uh, your interest's sake, but, but also this is related to tsunami modeling in several ways, and, and one is that submarine landslides cause very large tsunamis. At least they might be more localized than tele-tsunamis, but it can create large tsunamis. Uh, but also, like we were looking at earlier, in some places the inundation front of a tsunami is actually more like a debris flow. So, so debris flow modeling is, is relevant to tsunami modeling in, in several ways. Uh, so our, our, I won't get into the details of our debris flow model, but it is another depth average model. But it's two-phase because it takes into account the interaction between fluid and, and grain. But here's the top view of that in the source region here. So maybe later in the, the week, if people are interested in maybe pursuing studying or, or moving your research in the direction of, of tsunami-induced landslides, uh, be, I'd be interested to talk to people. So for an admittedly fairly crude model for, for the complicated physics occurring in a debris flow, um, uh, and you know, it does a fairly, these depth average models can do a fairly good job of reproducing the, the runout extent. And this is just one of, of several debris flows we've looked at where it tends to reproduce the behavior fairly well. Um, a shallow water model, uh, literally a single phase shallow, wa mo shallow water model with high friction can't really reproduce the behavior of a debris flow because a, a debris flow doesn't have uh, a rheology essentially. It's not a, it's not a fluid with a rheology. Um, this is looking down at that place where the, the debris flow bifurcates. I think it's just kind of an interesting view. But in these debris flows, you always see these pulses of, of material. Uh, and we think that has to do with the initiation process, which is much, much different than with a, a fluid model, a single phase fluid model, because the, you can, the, the stress model is essentially evolving in a way. It sometimes behaves like a deforming solid and sometimes behaves like a, a fluid. Uh, so one more of these. This is a close-up view of the source region. But you can see this This is a drier material, material and you can see it sort of liquefy and, and fail in waves. But, okay. Okay, so moving on. Sorry, uh, just wanted to give kind of a preview of all the different type of problems that we can work on, and hopefully people will be interested in, in working on different aspects of tsunami modeling, maybe looking at debris in the inundation front or something like that. Um, so all these depth average equations, we start with uh, uh, flow between a, either a fixed bottom or actually in general we can let B, this bottom surface, vary in time also if we're considering a fault motion or, or a landslide or something. Um, and then a, a free surface, which I'll denote eta. Uh, there's some length scale in the horizontal direction, and we typically, for these problems, expect that to be longer than the depth of the fluid. But the idea behind all the depth average equations is that you can start with full 3D equations. So this is just a, a slice, but in the real world, of course, it'd be 3D. Um, and we can... Uh, the, the, these 3D equations can be as accurate as we want them to be, or as good of a model as, as you might want, not your Stokes or whatever. But in the depth averaging, you make some assumptions about the stress model and also the vertical flow pro profile, how U varies through this depth, and then you integrate from the, you integrate the equations from the bottom to the surface and apply kinematic or, or other boundary conditions at the top uh, and, the, and the bottom. So that then yields a system in 2D for what I'll typically call Q. And for tsunami modeling, that'll typically be the depth and the two momenta. 
for other systems like two-phase systems or uh, multi-layer systems, we might have more variables. Um, so, so just as an example, uh, and the reason I'm showing all this is not to belabor the derivation of, of shallow water equations or depth average models, but I want to make it clear where the where the approximation really comes from in these different approximate models, whether they be dispersive or shallow water. Um, so let's say we start with a, a system of governing equations that's as good as we want it to be. So let's let's say we think it's a uh, accurate enough assumption to treat the tsunami or whatever uh, water flow problem as incompressible. Um, let's say it's inviscid, and that, that's fairly standard approximation for this scale of problem. Um, so we start in 3D with this would be these two are conservation of mass, right? And this this gives us incompressibility of the fluid uh, and conservation of momentum. Um, for most of the uh, tsunami models or, or any problem at that scale, uh, the, we can consider the, the density uh, constant and then this becomes trivial and we just have incompressibility and conservation of momentum. Um, and then kinematic boundary conditions at the, at the, uh, the bottom and the top. And notice in general we can let the bottom be a function of time. Um, okay. So actually, there's one, one thing to notice here, and that's this, this system is closed. We can actually solve for the pressure because of the incompressibility condition. And the, the free surface is determined entirely by the, the boundary conditions. Um, so if I, if I neglect the y direction and write these uh, for uh, a slice with uh, just u and w, uh, the equations on the last slide would look like this. I can then integrate them from beta eta, apply these boundary conditions, and then if you go through uh, switching the order of differentiation and, and integration and go through calculus exercise, you end up with equations that look like this. Um, so now the, the depth of the fluid is one of our differential equations. It's no longer just a boundary condition on the surface. And we have a, a, a evolution equation for the, um, the depth and u bar, which I'm calling uh, any, I'm using a bar to denote depth averaging or integrating from the bottom to the top and then dividing by that depth. So bar is the depth average of whatever quantity. Um, and so notice we have a, a pressure, uh, depth average pressure, pressure at the bottom, and depth average of u. But notice here, this, this actually refers to the depth average of u squared, not the depth average of u squared. Um, so these equations, at this point, so far, I haven't made any assumptions. So we started with that inviscid, incompressible fluid, and no assumptions have been made yet. So we've lost information by depth averaging, but these are still exact in a sense, um, as far as assumptions. So all of the, the depth average models for uh, tsunami propagation, most of them can be written in this way. And, and so it's what assumptions you make from here that lead to the different models, whether they have dispersion or, uh, or not or different, different mathematical properties. Um, right. Uh, another thing that happened that's uh, somewhat, it's a little bit perplexing to me actually, but it, somehow by, by averaging the vertical dynamics, integrating through the depth, the system's no longer closed. So we can no longer solve for the pressure, or the depth average pressure. So we have to come up with some model for the pressure. Um, and it's also, you should also note that, that this quantity here, which appears here, is not the same as this quantity. In fact, if those two are equal, that implies that, that u does not vary through the depth. It's constant through the depth. Um, so it turns out those, those are actually the, or that's, for the, sh the shallow water assumptions, that is the assumption made for the depth average uh, uh, velocity, that it's constant through the depth, and also that the pressure is hydrostatic. So this would be hydrostatic pressure, meaning that there's essentially no vertical acceleration of the water particles. Right, so if we make those assumptions, we can then rewrite the equations this way, where we have u bar here, but also here squared, so we've made this assumption, and then filling in this for the pressure, we get these terms here. Regarding uh both, -huh. so the second one is related with dispersion, and probably you're both. You're neglecting dispersion, but the first one will, will be affecting the actual displacement. Mm -hmm. What's the effect of the first assumption? 
uh, what's the effect of it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it. I, I think dispersion would, if some other, uh, some other approximation for this term would be, in a, in, in a sense, assuming some sort of profile through the depth, and I think that would lead to dispersion. Um, definitely assumptions on the pressure other than hydrostatic is one <laughs> source of dispersion in the dispersive models. In fact, you can derive higher order approximations to the pressure taking it into account, the vertical acceleration, and that leads to equations similar to Buzanesi equations. So yeah, the, the dispersive terms in those models does come somehow from those two assumptions. Uh, okay. So, so I've removed the bar from the U here because that's just one of our variables that we're solving for now. So we have a closed system for depth and, and momentum. Um, turns out the shallow water equations, the system here, are a nonlinear hyperbolic system. We'll uh, introduce that here later, more this week. Uh, they lack dispersion. That's been talked about a lot today. Um, hi these hyperbolic systems present numerical challenges that are unique to those problems, and specialized numerical methods have been designed for, for such systems. And GeoClaw is based on one set of those, those one uh, group of those methods. Uh, so just briefly to show, in 2D, this is what we're really solving for tsunamis. We now have a, uh, a system uh, for HU and HV, the two transverse momenta. And I'll often refer to the solution vector as Q. Um, so this has talked, been talked about a lot today, so I don't know if I need to go through this too much, but uh, the idea is uh, we made these assumptions. How accurate are they? Uh, well, as we've talked about, the, the shallowness assumption that the depth of the flow is small compared to the horizontal length scale, that's what you can argue to, to uh, uh, that's what you can use to make a case for the shallow water equations being accurate. In fact, you can show that the, that gives you the, the first order solution when epsilon's small. Um, but it's, should note that often the shallow water equations are used when this is no longer true and it's, it's not always clear how well it works or doesn't work. Um, it can match data fairly well, like I showed with that Malpasse uh, flood, but one needs to be careful and remember that when they're using software and models like this, that, that they can be used in situations where they may not be accurate or applicable. Um, and also that when we talk about the reliability of shallow water equations, uh, not only does it depend on problem scales, but it, it also depends on the degree of detail desired. And I guess what I mean by that is, what, what questions are you trying to answer? And uh, uh, it's like Professor Liu was talking about, if, if, if you're interested in, in a tsunami predicting arrival times and get a general feel for how large the amplitude of the wave might be, then linear shallow water is probably good enough. Um, but if you're interested in more detailed aspects, like how much resonance might build in a, a particular harbor, should it be you know, constructed a certain way to avoid that? Or if you're looking at a bathymetry focusing waves in certain ways and leading to large run-up in given areas, then for, for more complicated questions like that, then it might be important to look at dispersive or uh, more accurate models. Okay, so this uh, is touching a little bit on what we talked about earlier, but what really causes tsunami initiation? Uh, so I'll, we'll look at the two main types of tsunamis, the co-seismic tsunamis uh, and landslides. So co-seismic tsunamis are generated by fault motion and the coincident alteration of the seafloor. Um, my argument is that the spatial scale of the seafloor displacement determines the initial wave profile. So literally just the shape of the change in the, the seafloor gives your initial wave. That wave energy and the, the, and, uh, the energy that's in long waves then propagates great distances, whereas the small-scale small, uh, um, small scale, um, displacements or, or source of energy then dissipates in that region. Um, for, for landslides, the scales are somewhat smaller in the horizontal extent, but they can produce very large amplitude tsunamis, even larger than, than uh, uh, co-seismic tsunamis. Um, there are several, quite a few examples, actually, where they've produced run-up of, of over hundreds of meters uh, in localized bays and so forth. Uh, but they're typically more localized, but they are a, a, a hazard when looking at uh, 
certain regions where there's, for instance, nuclear power plants or something like that, uh, landslide generated tsunamis can be actually more of a threat than, than co seismic tsunamis. Um, so this has been talked about by Professor Liu and others, but uh, uh, it is interesting to consider the spatial scales of a tsunami. Uh, the characteristic horizontal length scale is roughly 100 kilometers. So I'm talking about in the deep ocean and the ocean basin. Uh, the ocean depth is deep, but it's uh, very shallow compared to the, the wavelength, so that's why the shallow water approximation is one that's commonly used. Um, so this has been talked about, but, but I think tsunami initiation and propagation are prim primarily a long wave phenomenon. Um, and that the transport of energy over long distance ocean basins is reasonably approximated by depth average equations and I think by the shallow water equations. Uh, so getting back on sort of the same topic, but this, I, this is a cross section during the uh, simulation of the 2010 Chilean tsunami. I think that's Chile here. So notice the, notice the different scales here. The wave amplitude is only just over 20 centimeters. Uh, the wavelength, um, you know, roughly almost 500 kilometers or so, um, but that's of course very long compared to the depth. But also notice that the 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 bathymetry here varies rapidly, much more rapidly than actually the waves of the of the tsunami. Um, so if you think about a, a tsunami as as you know, here, let's consider this the, most, the, the ocean at rest. Uh, the tsunami itself is actually a tiny perturbation to that steady state that's maintained by the balance of the pressure gradients and these topography terms. So capturing a tsunami numerically actually requires capturing a very tiny perturbation to a stable system. And it turns out that can be difficult numerically when we solve the equations with these finite volume methods. So later in the week, um, I might talk some about this the development of these methods that are called well-balanced methods that are, that are designed to capture these small perturbations. Um, right, so. so they begin as a small perturbation to uh, this steady state, just the flat constant top. Um, so this motionless steady state is exactly governed by the shallow water equations. It's the one solution that the shallow water equations can exactly govern because the pressure is hydrostatic and there is no uh, velocity. So if we think about the initiation of the tsunami, it, be, it begins by altering this, this uh, steady state balance. And the steady state balance here I have in the, the black terms here. Um, so notice we've got a balance. Let's see, this term here should be red, but there's a balance here from the varying depth or pressure gradient and the uh, <coughs> source term from the variable bathymetry. So here's the steady state balance. Now, what happens as we move the seafloor? Why is this, this balance perturbed? Well, it's entirely because of this equation here. So there's an introduction of uh, potential energy in the form of hydraulic head by simply altering the shape of the, of the sea surface. And then that only enters the momentum equation later. So the, the seafloor motion is not a source of momentum. It's a source of hydraulic head by disturbing the flat motionless ocean. And then later that then gets transferred into the momentum equation. So this, this here is still true before horizontal momentum happens, uh, this equation. But then this, this equation gets perturbed simply by that, that changing of, the, of the, the shape of the surface. And then only after that then does that become a source of momentum in the momentum equations. Right, so, um, so I guess what, I, what I'm trying to get at here is this, this is what we were sort of talking about earlier. That this is, my argument is that the tsunami essentially is generated by the shape of that seafloor, which introduces hydraulic head, and then later that uh, gets propagated into the, the momentum equation. So... I think I might be having movie problems also. Uh, well, I was going to show the fault motion um, from the 2004 Indian o Ocean Tsunami, and it's, 
interesting to watch that you can we used a temporal spatial temporal model of the seafloor moving and you can see that the time scale of that uh, rupturing uh, fault which actually is fairly long it takes 10 minutes or something like that to to propagate all the way up uh, during the um, as the faults failing from the south to the north but the tsunami waves are on a much slower time scale even though that's a fairly long fault rupture and they, essentially if you watch them they're in place and then propagate outward at a much slower time scale uh, so I don't have the movies but um, okay so I briefly want to introduce uh, the class of equations that shallow water equations belong to because all of our numerical methods are, are developed for that class of equations and later this week when Donna Calhoun gets here or I think Monday she's going to be talking about these problems more generally so I want to show how, the, how they um, are related to shallow water equations and tsunami modeling. So we can write the, uh, we have the shallow water equations in 2D. We can write them more compactly like this, where Q is our, our vector of conserved variables, H, H, U, and H, V. And then we have the gradient of these flux vectors. And then here on the right, we have a source term. Uh, so, right, so color-coded here, Q, the F flux, and the G flux, the flux in the Y direction. And on the right hand side here, the source term. Uh, well, it turns out that this 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 compact form here uh, belongs to a more general class of, of equations if the fluxes f and and g satisfy certain properties. Um, so these are hyperbolic conservation laws in 2D. They can be written like this, and there's a large class of equations which belong to this, uh, or a, a large set of problems which belong to that class. Uh, so more generally, Q can be any vector of conserved variables with m components and, and so on. Um, in general, this is a hyperbolic conservation law. A general hyperbolic si system is of this form, where A and B are, are matrices, um, m by m matrices, and a hyperbolic conservation law is just an example of this class of equations when uh, the matrix A here is actually a full Jacobian of a flux. So this, this equation here is a subset of this more general equation here. And the, the methods we work on are designed for this general class of equations. Um, you should say note, you should note that this, if, if you consider this in 1D, say not 2D, um, notice this looks a lot like the equation that uh, uh, Professor Scott was showing earlier. It's essentially, it looks like an advection equation, but it's nonlinear because this, this term here depends on Q. Uh, typically, these conservation laws are derived from a weaker law uh, over regions. So th th this is a more fundamental form of the equations and that's of often used to generate the PDEs. Um, so this is in general, in, for example, ex ah, sorry, I'm getting tired. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for example, let's say our region where this uh, conservation law is satisfied as a rectangle, then we can develop numerical methods based on that idea. Or it doesn't have to be a rectangle, but our numerical methods are, are uh, Cartesian grids. Um, so for our methods, we use logically rectangular finite volume grids. Um, they're not necessarily Cartesian in real space. We can map them to spheres and so forth. Um, but in computational space, they're logically rectangular. We think of the solution as being a piecewise constant function, which is the average of the true solution in that cell. Um, so that the numerical solution is defined everywhere. And then the solution is updated in some manner from time Tn to Tn plus 1 by determining either fluxes or somehow how the adjacent cells uh, affect the, the cell Ij. So for a depth average flow, that means we break up the domain into, into uh, grid cells, piecewise constant function defined everywhere. Uh, looking down on it, notice that we have wet cells and dry cells. The shoreline is defined simply by the, uh, where that boundary lies, so inundation modeling requires filling and draining the dry cells. Um, so how do we actually get the numerical update? to uh, 
determine the fluxes or somehow update the solution. Geoclaws based on what are called Godinov methods, which means the numerical update comes from determining uh, by solving Riemann problems. A uh, Riemann problem is just starting with piecewise constant initial data and then analytically solving the PDE for a certain length of time. Um, so if the, if the numerical solution is a piecewise constant function, we then analytically solve the PDE between adjacent grid cells, and that determines the numerical update. <coughs> so for instance, um, between C this cell and this cell to the left of it, we solve the shallow water equations over this time with these simple initial conditions. Um, and then the solution at, at, at the next time step is, comes from averaging that analytical solution. So for instance, for a depth average flow, we have two cells here. We act, these are our initial conditions. We solve the problem. So we solve the problem and then re-average. This is somewhat misleading because there would also be Riemann problems occurring here and here. The CFL condition is equivalent to, to uh, making sure that these waves, which came from the interface, don't enter into the adjacent cell. So uh, that, that gives you a CFL condition, or a current number of one, if these exactly reach this other end. Yeah? Would you have variations within the cell? Or maybe oh, okay, so this, this, these figures represent a process that we do to get the update. Ah, okay. So we're analytically solving this set of PDEs, in a sense. And that's what the figures show, but um, that then is used to get the numerical update. Um, and this is a, uh, just going back to the point I was making earlier. If you think about tsunami propagation uh, over the deep ocean where you have that variable bathymetry and this really long wavelength, small amplitude wave, if you were to, for an actual tsunami, if I were to make these figures to scale, you wouldn't even be able to see the, uh, you know, often th this update is tiny compared to th this background stuff. Um, so that's, that's why I was saying earlier that it's difficult numerically to capture that because often um, numerical noise from unbalanced methods can be actually larger than the, the tsunami mo you're modeling because the tsunami is actually quite small as a perturbation. Okay. Okay, so I think Donna will talk quite a bit about re you know, certain specifics of Riemann solvers and that type of thing, but I just want to give sort of a general flavor of, of how these numerical methods work. Uh, so this, these next few slides, that this stuff has been talked about a lot today too, but um, in 1D we can write the shallow water equations this compact way, and the derivative of the flux here can be written as the Jacobian times Qx, so we can write the shallow water equations this way, and for general hyperbolic systems of this form, uh, the wave speeds are the eigenvalues of this Jacobian. Um, so for shallow water, waves travel at the speed of the eigenvalues of, of f prime. So that's where this, this property we've talked about today about the, the wave speeds, it comes from the eigenvalues of the Jacobian and the shallow water equations. And for those equations, the eigenvalues look like this. And of course, there's this term square root of gh. Uh, so as Professor Liu pointed out, note that in the deep ocean, this means that tsunamis propagate at very high speeds. But <clears throat> when they enter shallow coastal waters, that can slow, you know, slow dramatically. Well, once again, if you consider the, the scale of these waves, uh, if once, it would be better if it was propagating this way, but let's say this wave here is reaching uh, the continental slope here. It's going to slow dramatically at the front, but it's going to keep moving fast at the back. You know, so it'll slow here and keep moving fast here as it crunches into the coastal waters. Um, so even though this problem we could clearly linear, linearize because this amplitude here is so small compared to this depth, you know, here we have several kilometers and 20 centimeters. <coughs> if we, we could linearize that problem, but the, the wave speed still depends on the, on the ocean depth. So even for the linear problem, the long waves compress near shore. And if you think about the complex bathymetry, that means even for the linearized equations, the, the variable bathymetry can strongly focus waves and, and lead to diffraction and that type of thing. Um, but another fact is because of this compression of the waves during shoaling, we often need a much higher resolution uh, computational grid near the shore. Um, so 
the upshot is that tsunami modeling requires resolving extreme multiple scales. And this, in particular, I'm talking about doing not only propagation, but also inundation modeling. Um, so if you have a, a global scale simulation domain, deep ocean propagation is roughly a wavelength of 100 kilometers, uh, but the waves are actually fairly localized at any given time. So they propagate throughout the domain. Um, near shore wave compression and topographic features mean that you often need meter scale resolution for inundation modeling. So if you consider like a, a, a harbor with a seawall, to resolve that seawall you need roughly meter scale resolution. Um, so the point I'm making here by all these is that the grid resolution, the optimal grid resolution is highly temporally and spatially dependent. Uh, so that's what motivates us to use adaptive mesh refinement. Um, so there's no way with a, with a static grid that remains the same throughout the, your computation, there's no way to have an optimal grid resolution at all times. When you say compression, it's basically shelling? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and that process is largely due to the variable depth, not the nonlinear. The nonlinearities kick in later, but most of the wave compression is because of the variable depth. If you, when you linearize the shallow water equations, uh, you still have a variable coefficient uh, you know, if you think of advection with a constant speed, the shallow water equations are like that, except your speed is a function of space. So, um, so yeah, I, I mean, in my opinion, most of the compression happens due to that, and then the nonlinear is kick in when you're really, you know, already inundating, essentially. Um, so I'll, I'll try to hurry through the rest of this, but um, I think most of you understand AMR, or have seen it, but the idea is that you have multiple... Uh, grid resolutions during a computation um, and at these multiple levels, so I'll refer to each level as L, that's not necessarily a grid, that's a, a, a level of grid, meaning a grid with a given re or a given resolution of grid. Um, and these nested grids would then resolve with the waves and the grid arrangement evolves uh, based on the solution. There are different types of AMR, but the AMR we use in GeoClaw is patch-based, which means that it's just blocks of logically rectangular subgrids within blocks of other logically re rectangular subgrids. Um, the goal, of course, is to optimally, meaning of efficiency and accuracy, accommodate these varying spatial uh, features in the solution. Uh, yeah? As the, as the meshes get like, refined and you're adapting, does it check also the quality of the mesh? The quality? Yeah, like sometimes when you have like a Right. Yeah, but, um, I think I'll get into some of those details next time. But the, oh. but for these, uh, yeah, for these free surface flows, it turned out that it was pretty tricky to use AMR, and it's uh, the standard way it's used for hyperbolic problems. Like for instance, AMR typically is you always in interpolate the conserved variable so that you can maintain conservation. But uh, with, with these problems, we had to get around that because we were introducing things larger than tsunamis by just this interpolation. Uh, but yeah, it is. AMR introduces a lot of headaches, <laughs> but <laughs> it also solves a lot of problems. So it's kind of a uh, you know blessing, and, blessing and a curse. Um, but yeah, it's a very simple idea. It's 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 difficult to to code, and but but the idea is very simple. You simply refine grid cells uh, into more, and these. These might be refined too, and then those are organized into rectangular patches. Um, and then, um, so for instance, uh, this might be following a wave, uh, propagating through the ocean. These patches of, gri of, of grids evolve with the solution. Um, so you've seen the simulations that pretty much uh, explains it, except for the details. Uh, so I'm just going to end by, by um, just briefly saying a few words about Clawback and GeoClaw. Um, kind of buzzwords so you get a, the feel for what they are and then next time I'll, I'll go into detail on some of these things. So claw pack is this more general uh, open source package for hyperbolic problems generally. Um, finite volume methods. Uh, these are high resolution. That means they're second order um, for smooth solutions but they're shot capturing like we saw in the last lecture where you, you don't want these uh, extrema generated around shocks. So that, that's total variation diminishing eliminates that problem. Um, and those are known as shock capturing methods. 
We use Riemann solvers, AMR, and then GeoClaw is then the subset of ClawPack. And so I'll talk about this more next time, and I think I'll end there.